Hey folks, we're gonna be talking armor making with our friends Wigwig Cosplay. I'm Rob Splatman and this is Nick Moss. It's Rob. Uh, to the right of me, as always, is Taco Cat there. And once again, we have our friends Wigwood Cosplay join us. How are you two doing? Good. Pretty good. How are you? Uh, thankfully avoiding snow, so... <laughs> us too. Yeah, somehow. I don't know how <laughs> it's know possible. How... Yeah, how... so... I'm surprised you guys haven't gotten hit. It's like... <sighs> Dear Lord. It's and bizarre. Then... <laughs> Just glad I'm done with school for now. <laughs> Yay, yeah. done with school. You got... Now you can go to grad school and continue the pain. <laughs> <laughs> More pain. <laughs> More pain. So today, like I said, we're going to be talking armor making and Alan Janelle for YouTube. This is a big thing for you. Um, but Kirsten, actually, uh, I want to start with you real quick because you have been exploring some of that yourself. Um, though you you now realize how much work goes into it, even with what you have worked on. I mean, did you kind of yeah, mix? Yeah, definitely a lot. What's because that? There's been, so there's been like three phases of the armor stuff I've worked on. There was the initial stuff that was made from like foam mats. Then there was some of the Bowsette armor where I first used Warbla. And now there's the Ebon Blade, which is just a huge pile of everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, and lots of mixing of different things involved, which we'll talk more about the different bits in a little bit. Oh yeah, so so you two have actually talked um, about armor making at cons, and so one thing I'm kind of curious, especially from the educational aspect, is what's been the reception to the, to that kind of info being shared, um, especially when you when we could talk about how deep of a rabbit hole armor making is. Yeah, I think it's I think it's one of our more popular um, panels that we posted. Um, there's there's always a few people at any given con who are you know thinking about making that transition and trying out some armor making or some foam mm -hmm. smithing and different things. And it's just a, it's nice to have that panel to be like, okay, I'm looking at getting into this. I should go to this panel to get some initial information. So there's always there's always a um, an audience of some size for it for sure. Um, interest in armor making is generally generally pretty high. People have a lot of curiosity about it. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with it. So Oh it yeah, definitely. Definitely. So when we put put together the stream notes here, uh, Alan, I think you were the one who put most of the info here. There's a lot. So, <laughs> I mean, but we are talking armor. Well, and if there isn't a lot in any aspect of cosplay, then you're probably not doing it correctly. Um, so this was a big thing for me, and we actually got a question about this, was around material. Um, and I'm going to phrase the, like one question I had and actually somebody else asked that was around, you know, look versus wearability versus movability versus comfort. And then you had, you know, cost, which is, I mean, that's a huge thing too. So, so kind of, so walk us through like your thoughts on material specifically. Well, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's always the first question you have to ask, right? You can't right. put anything together until you have stuff to put together with. Um, which can make it kind of daunting because there are a lot of options out there nowadays. It used to be pretty like cut and dry, like you're going to use EVA foam mats and that's what you're going to use. But now we have a lot of options available to us. Yeah. I still think if you're just starting out and you're not sure where to start, uh, EVA foam mats are a great place to start. Yeah. Uh, because they're inexpensive. Um, they're readily available at like hardware stores and, and things like that. And if you make, uh, you know, if you if you mess up your first couple pieces of armor, it's not that big a deal because it was like ten bucks for a pack of yeah. or you know two foot by two foot sheets of it. Um, so I think that's a great place to start. Uh, but there are a lot of, I mean, there's a lot to get into look versus wearability and stuff. I mean, a lot of things end up looking fairly similar if you, like once the paint goes on. Mm -hmm. But durability is huge. Yeah. Uh, certain certain ones that are a lot better for like colder climates versus warmer climates mm -hmm. or colder ponds and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I guess uh, we could dig into a lot of the <laughs> specifics if you want. 
Well, but yeah. I would say as just like a, a rough starting point, start with EVA and then start learning about like thermoplastics and clay, uh, foam clay and things like that. Well, that's actually one thing. Options. I'm, yeah, that was actually one thing I was really wondering about because I know about EvoFoam as a starting point. I mean, even now yeah. Michael's, uh, actually no, Joanne sells it in various different thicknesses I and think styles. Michael's also do they? Okay. Yep. So yeah, they have a cosplay section. It's kind of squished into the back now. Right. Yeah. So, but I know that's always a starting point. I always hear cos cosplayers talk about. Um, and then now, you know, we're seeing, you know, kind of like always the next step is typically Warbler, which I thought was interesting for a lot of people. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know how much Warbler you you two use in your in your projects. I'm kind of curious on your take for Warbler there. <laughs> a lot. We use quite a bit. Um, okay. We we specifically use black Warbler. Yeah. Um, one and of the and I grabbed our one of packs, the Warbler so. options. I mean, yeah. Warbler came Warbler. became the big thing because it was the first one to really be like readily available. People were kind of using like PVC as a as a thermal plastic for a yeah. while, but PVC has some definite drawbacks, particularly. Yeah. This is um, the PVC. It's called Sintra. Yeah. So. Okay. I mean, some people just use PVC sheets. So. That true. Yeah. Um, the problem with PVC is that when you heat it up, it releases toxins into the air. So if yeah. you're going to use PVC, be aware of that and use like serious business um, industrial style uh, respirators. Yeah, respirator, re respiratory protection. Mm -hmm. um, because you don't want your armor set to take off two years of your life. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, be careful with thermal plastics. If you're just kind of using stuff that's cheaper and stuff, uh, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you're doing it safely. Okay. Uh, because it's definitely there's definitely a danger element there. Also, the PVC um, has sort of like the way it bends is it easily bends in one direction, but it's hard to get it to bend like in one direction and then have another directional bend on another oh. part of it. Because it'll like want to bow out where those two bends hit each other. Um, it doesn't have that kind of like flexibility that Warbla and the more like cosplay oriented thermoplastics do, where you can bend them this way and bend it that way right next mm -hmm. to it, and it just makes a nice. It might make it's like a little tab you can cut off and stuff like that. PVC does more of like a gradual bend, so you can't have hard um, like lines. Okay. Right. Well, I was going to say, and there was something, I, if I remember correctly, you had mentioned was that, like, actually Black Warbler is a little tougher than the normal stuff, or, or am I misremembering? Mm -hmm. You uh, mentioned something so about it. So, Warbler and Black Warbler kind of have the same attributes. Um, In a lot of ways. It's mainly Black Warbler has a slightly different melting point, and it's smoother oh, okay. on the one side, because this is kind of grainy, um, and then this one isn't as much, and then, like, Pearly art is it's just it's kind of its right. cousin. Um, this is the one that has a weird heating point, and you can't really see when it gets hot because when you can see when you've overheated black orbla, right. it turns like kind of ashy. It gets like a gray color to it. With pearly, you can't see it sweat, so you don't know if you're overburning it until it's like burned, and then you're like, oh darn. This yeah. So, but mesh art is the one that has a little bit more oomph to it, and that's right. actually got like a meshing on it. Oh yeah, that stuff I've seen. If, before. if you're looking for durability, um, I mean, all of them are plastic, so they're fairly yeah. durable to like actual wear and tear, and, like you know, bumping and things like that. The so, original is probably the strongest, right? Though. Except oh, well, okay. PVC is the strongest. I mean. That's not um, a level, though. But right, that's not a, just as a thermal plastic. Yeah. Well, I was saying, uh, as far as uh, durability, a lot of times with Warbler, what you're talking about more is like the heating point because the the lower heating point ones have a, a pretty big danger of like if they're in a hot car or yeah. if you're in a really hot area for a long time. Like if you hit that heating point for your for your Warbler, um, that's a big problem for your costume integrity. Yeah, exactly. well, <laughs> so in that regard. Um, black warbler is actually the least because it's got the lowest heating point, and your standard warbler has the highest heating point of the three. Okay. Well, I was going to say, Kirsten, you've got some of the transp art warbler there, correct? Yeah, I have the clear warbler, which I've used a little bit of, and compared to other warbler, it's kind of weird because it doesn't really stick to itself well. Right. No, so it hates don't want to itself. Kind of like with it at all. It's if you need a clear sheet to go over something, or maybe you're making a gem and you can just like heat and stick edges together, that works. But if you want to like sculpt some glob, that ain't gonna work yeah, with this stuff. And unfortunately, also, when you try to roll it, it clouds. And well, if it's gonna cloud a lot, what's the purpose of using clear warbler? And then and two, um, it picks up every fingerprint. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, it's, God. It's yeah. so difficult to yeah. work with. I, mean, I wish there were an easier kind of substitute for clear warble, honestly, because yeah, initially itself like the reason it doesn't stick to anything. These yeah. out of a combination mm -hmm. of clear warbler and black warbler, but that did not go well. The test failed. <laughs> As an aside, <laughs> um, be careful with glue with this stuff because some glues will frost it. Um, okay. If you glue it on the edge with certain types of glue, and I'm not sure exactly what the differential is and which ones do it and which ones don't, but I know some of them will be kind of like a weird frosty white effect like on, the, on the whole area yeah. around the glue. So be careful. Test if you're gonna use glue on it. Test it first and see if it's one of the ones that frosts it. Okay. And then I don't know about... if you guys tried red warbler. The oh, fire red. Very briefly. Yeah. We tried it. I haven't closed with that one yet. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't like it, but yeah. And so I don't have a lot of a lot of um, experience with it. The fire. It didn't really. I don't know. It just really didn't have any attributes that made it like super different than the rest of the warblers to us i guess we didn't yeah. you know need to heat it so many times or it didn't like test it so you know i guess like it's fire resistance yeah you know to the maximum but i just we just stick with black warbler but it's supposed it's to be pretty durable right like that's one of the mm -hmm. well i was gonna say and i heard fire resistance that's not like you're going to be setting yourself on fire for cosplay anyway so. <laughs> not intentionally not, yeah. <laughs> so, so to backtrack this because we talked about some of the different types of warbler and we kind of glanced over EVA foam and in that realm there is different types because you have right. your foam mats, you have high density, you have craft <laughs> foam. So do you guys want to talk about some of the different foams you've worked with and maybe what ones you use more than others and possibly reasons? Yeah, good point. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, do you, want to start? you mentioned the EVA foam sheets. So like ones that you can pick up at like Harbor Freight, Walmart, mm -hmm. um, the ones that are actually like the anti-fatigue mat where it's got the rough tracking on the mm -hmm. one side smooth on the other um that one was kind of the original one that we started working with yep. we still do use it sometimes absolutely because um, it's cheap it's cheap and it of oh, you know the 10 millimeter thickness that sometimes we're looking for and it's in a good, a good enough size and it comes right. in bulk and when you're making a lot of big things it works very well right but um i mean places like tnt cosplay and um well, TNT cosplay supplies and like oh SKS cosplay supplies and mm -hmm. stuff and I know Arda now sells it but like they have the big like 10 millimeter mat that you can buy yeah. in like the nice high density foam right okay um because so, the EVA foam is not high density no, it's just it's not um, I mean there's a reason why they're comfort like mats. pits and pox in it right so. the, the big advantage of yeah. using this over just an EVA fatigue sheet is that it's less finishing mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. You don't like with a, a fatigue mat. They don't care if there are like little little bubbles in the surface yeah. and like little pock marks and and just like irregularities. Whereas with this, it's made to be like a flat, dead, high density sheet, so it's mm -hmm. easier to finish this. Um, that would be the main difference. I've noticed working with the big sheets from Harbor Freight. So if you like that really um, textured side, mm -hmm. you have to be careful if you're going to glue that. I usually actually will try to like sand part of that off so it glues it better. Too. Otherwise, yeah. it will peel. And yeah. you know you don't want your big thing peeling apart, but with the high density stuff, it's smooth on each side, and yeah. you can just glue it and go. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a something where like it doesn't make a, a that much of a difference in the finished product. Like it doesn't. It's not like weighted differently, or you know, it doesn't have different properties really as far as like what it's going to look like on you. Um, the difference is how much work you have to put into it. Like you can save some money, but you're going to have to worry about the backside that's that's got the texture on it that you might have to sand off. You have to worry about some of the, the pock marks and the, the extra finishing you're going to have to do. I mean, you can end up with the same product. It's just, are you going to pay a little bit more to not have to do those steps when you're cosplaying? Or are you going to pay a little bit less and add a little bit more work for yourself? Yeah. Like, that's the main trade-off. So that, so that uh, especially with sanding foam, and I know some people have talked about this, um, let's actually talk about safety, um, you know, because you had mentioned working with PVC and the few yeah. can release. Uh, you know, and heated and stuff like that. So, you know, the fumes thing, you, you, we always hear about it, you know, because all the, literally all the chemicals are in cosplay. <laughs> Let's, right. you know, there's a ton. So that's always a thing everybody should be thinking about. Probably, um, so actually with that, uh, especially with, um, you know, with, you know, some of us have limited spaces, 
Um, you know, not everybody can have a garage. Not everybody can have like a super large room to work in. Yeah. So for that, maybe what would be some of your tips to suggest getting, you know, making sure you have good ventilation in there, especially like maybe say if you only have like one door to direct air out of and stuff like that. Um, so something I've seen some people do is like the paint booths that have um, mm -hmm. ventilation. So they just open their window and put it in the window and it vents out. They'll use that in combination with glasses and a mask. Like generally what I do, I have a good size patio with counter space. I do my sanding and stuff out there. And then painting, I do it in a well ventilated room. So. Right, I guess my biggest piece of advice is like, there are, um, there are ways you can improve the airflow in the room and stuff, you know, using fans and so on and so forth. But the big one for me is the personal protection. Cause like, no matter how, like if, if you're in, if you're not in like an industrial workspace, you're not going to be able to perfectly contain these particulates and these yeah. basically, I mean, when we're cosplaying, we're not working with wood, right? Like when you're working with wood, you're working with, you're looking at like wood particles. A lot of the stuff that we're working with in cosplay is man-made material, uh, which means it's like plastics and it's like, it's, it's a bunch of gunk that you do not want in your body. Like in general, when you're working with pretty much any cosplay material, um, it's not a natural material. It's not something that your body knows how to deal with. So that pr the, the layer of protection you need the most, no matter how good you're, you're dealing with the environment, and please do like, you know, do the things that make your environment better and add more ventilation, so on and so forth. The big one is going to be your personal level of protection. Like try not to go without that, you know, a ventilator, dust mask, you know, those sorts of things. Cause that's like your line of defense. Um, versus all those like man-made chemicals and, and all those things getting to you. Yeah, especially, especially make sure you protect your eyes. You yes. don't want that plastic dust getting in your eyeball right. that will irritate and cut and it's not fun, don't do it. Yeah. Get, like go to the hardware store, get the ones with the protective sides and the top. Like what I use is actually um, goggles that I had, well not goggles, they're like glasses that they don't have the band. Um, but I have them from a chemistry lab. So they're yep. nice ones yep. that are very protected yeah. top and side, not just like normal glasses that only cover this. Especially yeah, with and then the also paint. with foam, it's not even just only dust particles. It's also the fumes that come off of it too. Like if you're burning mm -hmm. it or um, your Dremel gets hot and starts to burn the foam, yeah. or if you're using a wood burning tool and burning the foam like on purpose, um, or when you're using your heat gun on it too to seal yeah. it, you know, the fumes, like you might think that, oh, I only breathe in fumes, but fumes can also get to your eyes and it really stings. So I highly recommend also wearing protective eyewear as well as, you know, a respirator of some sort when doing anything well, like yeah. or a thermal plastic. That leads to like one of the next things we're going to talk about glue. Try to wear gloves if you can wear gloves so you're not getting that chemical on your hands. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Not fun. Do, do as it. I say, not <laughs> as I do. No. <laughs> Occasionally I am bad and I glue without gloves, but I've gotten a lot better about putting gloves on, working with it. And then I also don't have like all of that dust under my fingers and I don't have to worry about trying to get all of it off. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you can. It, it doesn't have to be and like. And then you have to go to the store and you look like a total grubber. Right. You still <laughs> want the manual dexterity. So like you can get really thin gloves. Like you don't need to wear big chonkers. You just need some sort of layer, you know, like even those really thin um, like uh, cotton ones or like winter gloves, like just the thin ones. Mm -hmm. Or like I the ones do that are thin, like vinyl ones. Or you yeah. can even get yeah. um, like the thin gloves that people wear for food handling. Right. Yeah. Uh, you you can do those if you're not yeah. allergic like to latex. like latex. Um, yeah. Latex free ones. I think they're silicone or something. Right. Yeah. yeah. Those work very well. The ones that are like designed so you can still like use your phone, the little touch screen oh, yeah. enabled ones that you so you still have good like finger dexterity, but you're still putting something in between you and nasty stuff. So, and actually one, one thing you had on your list was actually sharp implements. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a reason you don't, you don't meet an old carpenter without a missing something. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just laughing. Cause when I was like, I think when I was like 13, my stepdad cut off two of his fingers and oh, it was shit. like a natural thing that happened in our house because they're, they're woodworkers. So it was like, oh. taking your stepdad to the hospital and I'm like, okay. My the, friend turns yeah. to me and they're like, is this normal? And I'm like, 
Yeah, people who <laughs> regularly work with sharp implements usually wind up cutting will end up cutting out. themselves. And cosplayers oh. are people who regularly, especially armor makers, are people who regularly work with sharp implements. Um, and that's all the standard, you know, safety hazard. Pay, just pay attention. Um, Please go slow. What was right. that, Kirsten? You got, uh, we didn't hear what you said, so. Oh, well, um, my Zoom must have went stupid. But what I was saying is even, like, with Dremels and sanding things, you need to be careful, because you can nick yourself with a Dremel and, like, sand off skin, and that's not fun. No. So it's not just the sharp things you use that pose a right. hazard. Mm -hmm. But the, I guess the, the, the two ones that I'll hit just really quickly before we move on <laughs> is cut away from yourself, yes. not towards yourself. Yes. And uh, don't use the sharp implements when you're crunching at 5 a.m. Oh, God. No, no. Because you will make a mistake them. if and you haven't do, slept. Don't do both of those at the same time. <laughs> it will only end in disaster. Yes. Yeah. So Cut towards people. yourself and you're sleepy. You've done something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, safety first, kids. So, patterning. Um, I know we all, you know we all do it, you know, for normal clothes type cosplay. Is there any differences when it comes to specifically to making armor that needs to be thought about with regards to patterning before you even start and like try to figure it out? I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, the, the the difference in patterning armor versus patterning other stuff, it, well, versus patterning like sewing stuff specifically, is armor has thickness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's really easy to get caught up like, like a sort of a similar error to mm -hmm. like when you're so when you're making a sewing pattern, you have to add um, like seam allowance, right, so that your your thing fits and so that you have enough fabric to actually show. It's kind of similar when you're patterning for armor because you have to you have to make sure that you realize that when you're bending this thing, you've got a thickness behind that, and so you can't fit something straight to you you know straight to your arm. Like if you try to make a bracer and you and you use like the measurement around your arm as the <laughs> sort of like the amount of foam you need to cut out, it's not going to fit right. because you're you're losing some of the um, some of the length because of thickness. Yeah, like what Janelle was pointing out, even though this is a lot thinner, so this inner measurement is going to be smaller than this outer one. So if you want this to fit your leg right, you need to compensate for the fact that this is going to be less than this. Because mm -hmm. foam two, does that, warblet does that. Right. Yeah, the size of foam too matters. So like a two millimeter craft foam is going to have less needed right. seam allowance because it can bend more and there's like not as much thickness. but you know, this eight millimeter is going to be really thick and it takes a lot of bending to get it to curve at all. So you're gonna need to add on a lot yeah. extra so you can actually make the curve. But it's not going to bend. One really. thing so, that reminds me is that I okay. learned with the first armor set I was doing, which was Sylvanas shoulders kind of like this with the built up detail on top is, um, Curve the bottom piece, then pattern the detail on top of it, cut it, glue it on there. You don't want to just stack it all flat and then bend it because that top one isn't going to want to bend as much as it has to. Because remember that further away from your skin it's going to be, the more length it has to stretch. Yeah. Another another note, uh, something you'll find in a lot of armor patterns, like if you go online, there's a lot of resources for like patterning um, specific stuff. <coughs> Certain like famous famous armor sets, you know, like Master Chief. You can go out and find yeah. Master Chief oh, yeah. all over the internet. Um, one thing you'll find in those sorts of patterns a lot of the time is to make up for that space, that thickness of the foam. They'll have um, they'll have a triangular cutout in the back of the armor that doesn't come all the way out to the mate to like the the front line, but you'll have a triangular cutout here so that you can bend this at a sharper angle. Okay some of this stuff that would normally get in the way you just kind of cut out with a triangular cut so one one watch, question that watch for those sorts of things so one question that actually popped into my head is with patterning what what do you need to have in mind when you're also considering how things to attach it to your body come into play you know like Evan Blade is a great example I mean all the straps and whatever 
mm-hmm. that are going to be involved, like you know, in the, does the, the yeah, the art shows I mean, this. good lord. Look I wouldn't it. be able to walk if it was this, so that's why it's two separate pieces that aren't conjoined. Mm-hmm. This will have its own strap and buckle to hold it in place while this is its own thing. Because otherwise, again, you can't bend if you make this one thing. You're going to be, you know, walking like a stick figure. <laughs> it wouldn't be fun. Um, usually the first place we look is actually at, like, old full plate uh, diagrams from, like, 1600s or so. <laughs> yeah. um, because those people had to move in their armor. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they were very good at figuring out how to move in their armor. So if you have something that's, you know, a semi-realistic piece of armor... Um, look at what uh, where it goes on your body, and then try to find the analog on like an actual full plate diagram. Okay. Um, a lot of times, those will, the, the, you'll be able to see like how did that bend, and how did they keep, stay like protected as they were you know bending their joints and their arms needed to move in their sockets and so on and so forth. So that's usually the first place we look for like how we're going to attach stuff and mm-hmm. still be able to move in it. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work because the armor that you're putting together for cosplay just isn't real. Or is floating just or would something. just would yeah. not work in reality at all uh it just looks cool and in those cases you kind of have to get a little bit more creative with it but okay. a place you can start is looking at historical stuff that's okay. usually really helpful for how they strap things on mm-hmm. yeah and, uh, and actually it's funny you talk about uh historical armor because uh there was actually somebody in another stream we were watching that were asking about scale mail and i'm like you know go go find like your local sca organization if you have one you know not far from you <laughs> So, so there's that. Um, that reminds me, um, like one piece in particular that I know a lot of people struggle with, an example is Saber, is elbow armor, or whatever you call that. I don't know what the actual name of what goes right there between here and the plates here. Then brace. Depending on that, you might not be able to move your arm. Well, I know this is the brace, but this thing, whatever goes right there. It's, it's called the Ben but... brace. <laughs> Okay, there we go. That's- <laughs> we have them on the Huntsman, so we had to learn the part. <laughs> we were like, uh, what so are those things called? Remember. Of, um, of, okay, well, I want to be able to do this to my arm, and I can't have this attached here or here. And historical is a great place that I know a lot of people look up for, especially mm-hmm. the arm pieces and um, hand armor. I've seen quite a few people do that, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, and and on here you also have uh, online resources. You know, you know there are some in person. You know, like I said, the uh, SCA groups. But I'm kind of curious, like what you have found specifically online that might be good places to point people to in the future. I mean, mainly, it's just kind of googling the armor types and then like seeing what you can find for the diagram, and then digging deeper into that search. Like, because usually that image will come from an article. And then you kind of fall down the rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> that's or, that's kind of the biggest one that we okay. they or like cosplay tutorials sort of stuff. Mm-hmm, like there's good. a lot of big names um, who like to put out a lot of like foam smithing tutorials and stuff like that. Yeah, there's some there's some really really great yeah. resources out there on like YouTube. Specifically um, that too, if you're together. if you're looking for more, I guess like modern ways of attaching armor, right. like elastic Velcro, mm-hmm. um, zippers, things like that that's a good way to look is back towards the cosplay community yep. and to armor smiths within our community but if you're looking for like belting and riveting and things like that you'll want to look to the historics because that that will be where those items will be more prevalent okay so let so let's talk shaping i mean we've kind of been talking about especially as far as materials go uh, to a degree though i know that's going to probably be like a pretty deep rabbit hole in of itself, especially with <laughs> with regards to whatever material you're potentially working with. Yeah, so I mean, shaping in armor smithing usually means heat shaping uh, for mm-hmm. most materials. Yeah. Uh, that's generally going to be your heat gun. Uh, so, <clears throat> again, here's, here's one of your stages where you need to think about the fumes and stuff like that because uh, you're yes. heating on purpose. And that means it's going to release junk. Um, but your heat gun is your friend. Definitely. It's your best uh, friend. Yes, it's your best friend. <laughs> You'll your be best using it a lot. Friend. The key to shaping your armor, after you've got it all patterned and stuff, and you need to get the curves and get the angles and stuff like that, uh, the key is going to be even heat. Uh, just practicing 
getting everything hot in whatever area you're working with all to kind of roughly the same temperature so that it bends the same. Okay. Uh, if you overheat certain areas and underheat others, you're gonna get, you might get funky bends. Uh, you might get a little warping depending on what material you're using. Uh, I'm kind of trying to stay material agnostic a little bit in the descriptions, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of little things depending on what material you're using. But in general, uh, even heat with the heat gun is going to be your ticket. Okay. I was saying, Kirsten, I, I saw you just grab the, uh, I think it's the plate for uh, Bowsette, wasn't it? Yeah, so sometimes when you do shapes, you want to involve like how you cut it and how you're heating it. Right. So like the cup on this, it's three bands that were um, bent and then glued and then bent some more. And then like this one was similar, but it's a top piece and then two bottom because I, know, I felt that that was a better shape for the overall shape it had to be. So you can easily do a combination of trying to figure out, okay, patterning wise, what will help get a curve and then, like I said, um, one trick is to help curve it before you glue it, because it's easier to glue together things that are partially curved Absolutely. instead of flat and flat and wanting it to curve. Don't do that. Personally, we don't we don't glue anything until it's fully shaped. Until we can like stick it together and it goes how we want it to, then we glue it. We don't we don't try to put as little tension on the glue as possible, just because that okay. longevity and, and durability, yeah. especially with breastplates, because the sides of breastplates are where it's going to bust open right. and that's usually where it's glued and i mean honestly i know a lot of people who also put extra securing inside of there like mm -hmm. covering it with warble on the inside to really get that foam to stick together or um if you're doing just a warble breastplate and getting the warble yeah, like together this yeah. one. two more reinforcement warble here's reinforced yep to make if sure that all yeah it doesn't come up <laughs> <laughs> if at all possible, you want to completely shape it before you glue. The, the, the best case scenario is your glue is holding the two pieces together and is not hanging on to any other tension. Because mm -hmm. um, if you put too much work on the glue, that's where your fail point's going to be. Um, you want it to only be doing the work it has to do, which is keeping piece A and piece E stuck together. Um, whereas if they're pulling, pulling away, it's going to cause a problem eventually. Well, and actually that, that, put, that put a question in my head uh, as far as adhesive choice in that regard um you know maybe what should people look for like if they know they they might run into that situation you know like what what adhesive should they maybe look at to help with that in that regard right well i, I think uh kirsten had the had the right idea on this so i'll, I'll let you give me your mantra mm -hmm. uh so pretty much for foam i mostly just use barge because it, you put like some on side A, some on side B, let it sit, and then you stick it together. And it's pretty fast for how quick that will bond enough to hold itself, and then you let it sit and finish drying. Um, if you use something like hot glue, well, one, you can be compromised by temperature, and two, it's not gonna wanna flex quite as well as yeah. a barge would. And I'm sure you guys, since you do a lot of judging, you've seen the bad aspects of both of these when people do it wrong. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's especially when people don't let the glue dry long enough when they're using contact cements, when they don't let the glue kind of get tacky before sticking it together, there's always more possibility that it might bust open. Um, yeah. Just because they didn't get to the tackiness that it needs to before it's actually joined and then dries. Right. That's when it's at strongest is when it's tacky. It's not when it's wet like other glues, like tacky glue or, you know, super glue and hot glue. Right. If you if you don't let it dry long enough, the problem you're going to run into is you've got your two pieces and you've got a little your your glue is still wet. It's not tacky mm -hmm. yet. When you stick it together, um, yeah, they're they're gonna, they're, 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 gonna they're gonna pop open a little bit yeah. because um, those glues are still like drying and becoming like fully grip gripped together. So as you put it to together, they still have that give. And so you're going to put it together and you're going to hold it for a minute. And then when you let go, they're going to just kind of come apart a little bit because they, they've got that. Um, well, they're still like bubbling and kind yeah. of elastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My general guide for barge is I won't even think about gluing it until the sides look matte because then it's not sticky. Mm -hmm. And even then I'll generally wait a couple of more minutes to be sure that it's not just that top layer that has dried, but all of the glue on there is dry because 
I mean, you could have the top stick well, but if the bottom isn't, you're just going to get that stringing across. Yeah. And if you see the stringing, that means you didn't let it sit long enough. I know that was one of the first things when I was first playing with Barge that I was like, okay, well, we'll let this sit for five minutes. We'll let this sit for mm -hmm. this. And you see stringing, it didn't sit long enough before you stuck A and B together. So, so one thing I also wanted to bring up here was, because uh, we kind of talked about this in the, you know, for some of the safety part, is actually grinding, you know, materials for armor. So kind of what's the concerns there? You know, more more from a design and look standpoint than say the safety part, even though that's important, of course. So. Yeah, I mean your sheets of your sheets of uh, foam or you know plastic or whatever are only going to get you so far with like how cool you want stuff to look. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, you're going to want to get like really neat organic shapes or like spikes or you know you're going to need to do something a little more special or like flutes and different like um, cool inlays and things on your armor. Uh, a lot of times, what you're going to end up doing in those cases is uh, well, for foam specifically, is you're going to end up. Uh, grinding the foam down or cutting it to, to graft in your, your different shapes. Uh, so that's usually going to be a Dremel tool or an exacto knife. Or an exacto knife. Um, the Dremel tool is is ubiquitous. It's yeah. you can it anywhere. It's very cheap. Uh, you can you want to get like the uh, for really detailed. So you can get different size of like your your tips so that you can grow. They're like big stuff so that you can grind stuff down easily and you can get really like fine ones so that you can make cool little mm -hmm. patterns, stuff like that in the foam. Uh, so definitely you can take advantage of the different tips available because usually when you buy like a combo pack for Dremel, you'll get like, there'll be like seven you get tips get done. for your, yeah, you, you know, do. it's just some yes. ridiculous number, but uh, find the ones that are that are going to be the most useful by just trying it on stuff. Um, yeah. you'll, you'll, you'll figure out pretty quick which ones are going to be useful for foam. Um, so what do you think about like the variable speed Dremels instead of just on off? Right. Um, it really depends on what you're doing. I've, I've found that the cheap on off ones are usually what I want because when I'm Dremeling or using the tool, a lot of times I'm trying to take away material. Mm -hmm. um, so I want a relatively fast speed, which is usually what the single speed ones do. Mm -hmm. The ones with the slow speed or the high speed and the, the more uh, variable are better for like sanding use um, okay. because a lot of times the single the single speed ones are too fast for good sanding. You're going to end up taking too much when you're not meaning to. Yeah. Um, when you're sanding, having the variable speeds is really nice because you can be like, okay, where's the level where I'm getting a sand without getting a material removal? Um, that's... I guess that's usually where I use the two different ones. Well, then also, and then also, like the differences in the in the grip for the sanding drums as well. When you look into that with speed, you know, that's a, yeah. something to consider. So definitely and true. Like one thing I do is, if I'm say working on a sword, I'm actually going to use a mouse sander rather than a Dremel because that's mm -hmm. just a flat thing that you can get nice edges with if you want it to be very crisp. Do you guys also use one? We have a finger sander. Um, that we use. Honestly, so, a lot of times I end up using, I have a belt sander. That too. <laughs> um, we've got the garage space for, for it. So we've got like a little workbench where we've got our different sanders. So we have a hand sander, a belt sander, and then the finger sander. And the finger sander was honestly the last one we added to the collection. Right. And it it's used specifically because we needed something that could get into small areas. And we had to watch a really weird like lumberjack <laughs> like hear me out <laughs> and um they were using this thing called the finger sander and they were doing like the super intricate little details of getting in there and sanding and we're like oh can't you do that on <laughs> and so we got one and we were like this is really neat they're kind it's, of expensive yeah but it's, like, it's pretty we niche we, we so. use it on certain things like specifically when yeah. we need to get funny little areas yeah. and carve and it's worked well for us so oh. i mean i don't think it for like everybody but like if you, if you find them really? you might need like finger sander it's pretty great i would i would probably only recommend it if you're into making bigger props mm -hmm. i don't know that it's as useful on armor as often yeah armor not so much but props like large swords when you need or to get into yeah anything that has like a really like well, that you need to get to 
if you don't need to be as accurate, if you get a mouse sander that has a, because usually they have like a weird like triangle shape, some of them have an extra piece on the top that is going to be um, narrower and have a point that could help with some corners if you don't oh, need yeah, as yeah. fine of detailing ability. Because mm -hmm. that could get into corners easily if you're just doing a little bit. <laughs> right. Doesn't the bottom of a mouse sander kind of look like an iron shape where it's like kind of yes, a... It's like yeah. An iron. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mine is like an iron and then it has that other little thing that yep. can come out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the nice thing about mouse sanders is you can change the grit of what's on there. So if you just want to do a quick sand down a bunch out of the way, it's fine. If you want to get it smoother, then to help towards, you know, priming and painting, you can do that too. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's really nice because they're not that big. So they don't take up a lot of room, especially no, if you're on, you know, limited space, it's easy to store. Um, one last note, just really quick. A lot of times with thermoplastics, you don't want to grind. Um, oh, no. Thermoplastics, you want to, <laughs> you want to have the shape that you're going to want them to be in um, before you put the thermoplastic on. So you might be grinding whatever material you're using underneath, things like that. But um, grinding thermoplastic is not easy and not helpful. I don't recommend it. Well, okay, and that actually leads into another part for shaping where we're going to talk about was around cutting. Oh, quick note. Quick note. Yeah. Uh, like, one of the issues with that, if you try to grind warbler, so you're creating a lot of friction, and mm -hmm. friction makes it heat up. What does it do when it heats up? It gets Melts. all goofy. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's not going to get you what you want. And then um, are you going to lead into cutting, Rob? Yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead and talk about cutting because uh, – you know, especially because you were talking about plastics and, you know, gr why not to grind, you know, mm -hmm. we talk about that. So, so kind of going into that a bit, I mean, we, part of it we kind of talked about with, you know, shaping in, you know, how the, how doing some cutting will help with that. So what are, what are the other things you should be thinking about with regards to cutting your material for armor? A sharp blade. Yeah. A <laughs> big bold italicized underlined. <laughs> Yeah, foam, yeah. I mean, especially thick foam, has a tendency to, to drag, and mm -hmm. uh, you won't get a clean cut if you have a not super sharp blade, um, yeah, which is why like we it's... say make sure you're awake and aware and safe <laughs> when you're using them, because you need a sharp if you're going to make a nice cut on Oh, foam. yeah. Oh, if you can see the difference here, but, like, yeah. this is nice and smooth, and then, like, this corner here has, like, a really weird kind of, like, Z, like, zzz, 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 yeah. zzz, and that's where you can see the blade was getting not as sharp, and it was starting to drag. Um, but, yeah, you can definitely see that. Yeah. And that's when you need to change your blade. Good news for thermoplastics, though. Usually, you want to cut those with, like, a scissor. Just a, mm -hmm. just a, junk, a junk scissor, scissor because oh. your scissor will immediately become dull. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. Scissor works well. Uh, if you're cutting something like PVC, uh, you want like a, you can do sharp knife cutting with things like warble and stuff, but it's really hard and has to be really sharp. Yeah. Um, yeah, at that point with warble, it's just honestly easier to use a scissor to cut it. Mm -hmm. You need to heat it up just a little bit to make it easier to cut. Like, go for it. Because if you don't heat it to the point where it's all goopy and melty, you'll be able to reheat it again. So, just to get it a little bit malleable, then you can cut it out. Yeah, a little bit. Main Careful thing though, because you might is the size. Generally, you want to wrap it to help the integrity of the piece. Whether it's just you know tucked under the edge like this, like this is just foam. I just rolled this edge over, and that's enough for it. You need to make sure you're giving yourself that basically a seam allowance around whatever piece you're covering. <laughs> All right, so yeah, very good point there. So uh, next up, we actually or we have sculpting, um, and you particularly call out foam clay, which Kirsten, I know you oh, have been clay. playing with some. So Great. I'm really curious about your experiences and what people should know about it. Did you want to tackle this one first, Janelle? Sure. Yeah. Oh, I really like foam clay. Um, I found it to be a material that. I guess it takes over the the spot of like what Sculpey and uh, air dry clay and things like that would have for the cosplay community, mm -hmm. um, and it's made it into a, a like it's like another material that we're used to foam. So we know how to Dremel it, we know how to sand it, we know how to prime it. It all it works very similar to the foam sheets, but 
the one thing that I have found out about foam, the foam clay versus like actual clay is that when it dries, it will expand slightly. Um, so if you put in small details, they won't stay as well as it's drying. Um, and it does actually get really fragile. Um, we had a couple instant in, like, instances where huntsman teeth broke off. Oh. This was foam clay. This is now epoxy sculpt because the tips all broke off. Um, oh, okay. Fragile. And that is something that, you know, epoxy sculpt can fix because now this is not going to come off. Um, <laughs> I guess epoxy sculpt will not break. <laughs> um, but, but it's, it's I, really nice for adding detail to yes, stuff. Like when I you need to build it. something out to make a detail rather than cutting an inlay. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely lightweight. It This weighs nothing. Like it's, you know, air. It, it's as light as air. Um, <laughs> and you can, you can dremel into it and you can paint it and you can prime it the same way you would say your breastplate. So if you add this onto your breastplate, it's not going to change how you would work to finish that piece all the way to the end once it's on there. So okay. you don't have to do any like extra little steps with foam clay just because you've added it onto your foam breastplate. Um, it does not like to stick to Warbler. Um, epoxy sculpt will stick to it, so that's super cool. Um, it loves to stick to itself, but if you have a piece of foam clay and then you add another piece of foam clay onto it that has dried for a little bit, you'll want to do a binding agent like a glue or, um, you know, just some... Yeah, it sticks until it's dry, then it stops yeah. sticking. Then it stops sticking. Um, it doesn't have that long of a work time unless you add water to it. So, like regular clay, you have to keep it moist for it to work <laughs> for the day. I see, Kirsten, um, it looked like you grabbed a piece there. Uh, yeah, I, I've used a lot of foam paint lately. So one thing I did yeah. for making all of oh, these dragon skulls and skulls is I started with a base of foam and then I cut out smaller pieces of EVA foam or, well, mm -hmm. craft foam. Uh, kind of like a contour map that had different layers. And then I use foam clay to build in and make this all smooth. So it's not solid foam clay. And then because of the brittle aspect and these being shoulder pieces that are probably gonna get hit on stuff, I painfully covered it in warbler. <laughs> it yep. was not easy. Um, but it was really nice for trying to get very, um, like having more control over the details because I would not have been able to Dremel all of this in place. There's no way. So, and then- Yeah, foam um, clay can add a really nice organic feel to things and you can mm -hmm. have a sculpted look to foam mm -hmm. that you can't Especially get with just a Dremel to... and carving away layers. Yeah, when it comes to things like bones and whatnot, cause that's what I've yeah. mostly used it for was skulls, you know, skull held at Evan Blade is. It's helped a lot for able, mm -hmm. cause again, sanding and dremeling i wouldn't have been able to make this shape but this is actually um it's like the base of the skull was uh tnt cosplay foam built up with foam clay and then the horns are just eva foam that i cut i dremeled and covered in warbler and stuck to the warbler skull yeah so covering it is not a fun process but you can do it i did it with black warbler for all of the shoulders i showed and it's it's just very great for using that. And like she said, um, it's really easy to work with. It's like clay. However, it's better, it's more malleable if you play with it first and add a little bit of water. And then like yeah. normal clay, um, as she said, you can prolong the life of it if you get it wet. And one thing I did that I learned in a like pottery class forever ago, <laughs> um, <laughs> if you get it, damp and put a bag over it and you like have it kind of sealed that will keep it damp and you can walk away for a day or two come yep. back and you'll still be able to work with it and it's not going to be too hard so that's what i did with these smaller pieces is hmm. i bagged it when i was like okay i'm done for now i don't want to look at this but i need to come back to it so spray it a little bit not too much bag it and you can go yep yeah another way you can do that if you're working on something um a paper plate put it on the paper plate, put a damp towel or a damp paper towel over it, then slide that in a gallon bag. And that is the easiest way to just keep small items um, for, for days. You can come back to it three, four days later and it's still, you know, slightly damp because you've sealed all that moisture in and it's kept the moldable. 
However, um, one thing I've seen, I don't remember who I saw post about this. You don't want to get it too wet because basically yeah. your foam clay will like basically <laughs> fizzle into just like a weird yeah. foamy liquid. And never yeah, it, hurt it's it. like a black, almost inky liquid. It's it feels really <laughs> gross. It feels like kind of like egg white. It's oh, like no. snap. <laughs> it's really oh. gross. It's foamy on top, and then just some weird liquid that's yeah. denser than water. But you can't do anything with it. It's not like clay where you can use that as a bonding agent between two pieces of clay. Now this stuff is not worth anything, and you can't work with it. So. It's basically <laughs> fine line apart. between making it moist to keep it and work with it versus ruining it with water. I kind of I equate foam clay to being foam once it's dry, clay while it's working. So like adding too much water to your clay will just turn it into sand. <laughs> Adding too much water to your foam clay will turn it into soup. something. So it'll turn it into soup. <laughs> foam soup. <laughs> foam. Toxic. <laughs> uh, so I actually want one question that uh, came into mind for me um, for sculpting. You know, sculpting as far as material choices, especially for those fine details. Uh, Kirsten, actually, if you want to grab the Bousette or a Bowsette plate again, you know, like one thing. Uh, you know, because I believe Kirsten was most of the curves in that for that was all warbler, correct? Like the uh... yeah, this is just warbler because I made the base out of EVA foam, covered it, and then I basically made warbler noodles. Heated this the um, cups, heated the noodle, and stuck the noodle on. Well, and I was gonna say, and also for Evan Blade because I remember you and I talked about this was making the very tiny bones. Uh, I forget it's for uh, Sylvanas or. I have them. Right oh, here. good, yeah. All so, those teeny tiny warble bones. Yeah. And the gem that I'm going to rip off and remake. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, what maybe should people consider as far as material choices to sculpting for doing those fine details? You know, stuff like that. Um, you know, maybe what should they think about with regards to that? So, I think the thing is, like, what level of detail you're trying to get. For those little noodles on the cups of Bowsette, mm -hmm. that's fine to use Warbla, because you just roll it, heat it on, you're done. But for doing a dragon skull, trying to keep Warbla at the right temperature to be able to do that, that would be too difficult, and you'd probably burn yourself and burn what you're working on. Um, when foam clay, it's pretty easy. Like I said, you can build up with normal foam, fill in with foam clay, and do whatever you want to it. You just have to make sure where that's gonna go isn't where it's gonna bend too much because it will crack like the teeth on the Huntsman. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, so and then like, um, I could have done these out of foam clay. I mean, maybe I would have been able to get a bit more detail to the bones, uh, but I wanted it to be easy to stick them on here rather than, you know, trying to glue down all these little things i just want to heat a little stick it heat stick heat stick so <laughs> and i guess a halfway house between warbler sculpting and foam clay sculpting would be thibra um mm -hmm. the other thermoplastic cousin that no one seems to talk about anymore <laughs> i used that once it was it's hard to work it's with. hard to work with because this is almost like a clay substitute of the thermoplastic world um okay really stretchy it's really moldable it shows every flaw in it so instead of like a warbler you can lay it over foam and you can have you know some rough corners or you can have some you'll you know lose, pockmarks you'll lose detail yeah. when you lay the, the warbler when you lose it. yeah because the warbler is thicker it doesn't show it won't like sink into those issues Thibro is like putting plastic cling wrap over something it yeah, just true. suction cups itself to every flaw and every pit mark and every pock mark in the okay. foam um, yeah, then feel wise when you're working to with cover it, things way with. way more plasticky. Yeah. Like, just like when you're trying to bend it, because I use that uh, for part of Star Guardian Syndra, the weird head thing, and a few of the other mm -hmm. things. Yeah, that was not a, a very great uh, first introduction to that material. Nope. And it is very easy. I, think, I don't know which one of you said it, said something about fingerprints for clear war blood. Mm -hmm. It's oh, just yeah. like that. Yep. You yeah. just slightly yeah. touch it, yeah. and you're gonna put a fingerprint in it. And yeah. good luck getting it out. One and of the things, Thibra, it's thermal plastic. Yeah, the thing Thibra I think is good for is if you need to do like minute details. Mm -hmm. You need um, a lot of noodles. 
This is really and basically great. how you would want to work with it, yeah, is you'd want to treat it almost more like a clay than okay. actually using it as a thermoplastic. You want to cut out like a little bit and like put it out, like heat it up and put it on something and work with it with like clay tools. Because like you said, your fingerprints will show and all that will show. So you want to use like a some kind of a smooth media to yeah, like the silicone tip tools probably because yeah, yeah. Have anything that works as a clay tool you can use like the wood tool well you can use you have wood to watch tools, out because the fiber will stick to stuff too if it's mm -hmm. hot it'll stick to wood tools don't metal tools are straight out yeah um, don't use metal tools. <laughs> um and then if you need to mold with your hands um getting silicone gloves or the silicone thimbles for your mm. fingertips um that will reduce the amount of like fingerprint damage that's left on okay. it okay can still actually well, and finger do damage if you heat it too much. <laughs> they well, can rob a bank. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna say purchase all of the cosplay <laughs> supplies. No. <laughs> well, Let's do yeah, that. Foam clay, when, clay when working with foam when done. You have fever that's clay when working with <laughs> plastic when done. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, and this actually makes for a good uh, a good uh, segue point because let's talk. Robbing smooth. banks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we all wear masks now, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's normal no one would know <laughs> but anyway so let's talk smoothing um you know especially because like you know when you're working with your material and it's just that kind of a pain you know and yeah. so i know one thing is about sanding and i personally have had this kind of hell because because of working on evan mm. blade thanks karsten um <laughs> But I know that's always a, a, a thing to think about, you know, both sanding and filling. Because, um, like I said, we have had that experience with Evan Blade and just kind of how much it gives it that finished look and really kind of takes a, a cosplay to the next level. So let's actually talk about sanding. We kind of actually did a little bit with, like, the tool aspect. Yeah. Um, and there's always, you know, the material choice. There's always material um, choice to think about too, um, in that regard as well. So, kind of how how do you tackle that, especially with your material choices? I'm kind of curious, and also to a point where paint will eventually come in. So, well, what I was gonna say is that um, where you're sanding is really important is when you paint it, especially if you're painting it like a metallic, something that's going to be shiny. If there is any slight indent or bump in that, it will show. So if you smooth it and sand it, then you won't have it like, um, I mean, your guys' Maximilian armor, you probably wanted that real smooth because it's a nice, you know, metallic, shiny thing going on. Yeah. Yeah, so speaking of smoothing plastic, because uh, when you're smoothing foam and stuff, then we're, we're talking about the Dremel, we're talking about the sandpaper, all the stuff that we were kind of mentioning earlier. Um, with, with thermoplastic, it's harder to grind. Like we were saying, you can't really grind it. Um, so what we use is this guy. Oh, which yeah. It's it's one of the, like, 13 things in the utility tool world <laughs> called a hot knife. Um, but <laughs> so many. So it might be hard to search, but you want this one. Um, it's it got, is by well, this Tool one's, Shop. Yeah. So it's basically just got, like, a hot. The black and well, I was going to say, it reminds me of a soldering pen, but just a blade instead of. Yeah, this. exactly. It's like a big one. Um, because this hot. guy, yeah, this guy has an adjustable dial for how hot it gets. Oh, nice. Okay. You can adjust it to be kind of like the heat that you need to, specifically we use it for Black Warbler, which is why this is black. <laughs> yeah, because that's where I remember there was a stream you were working on Black Warbler to you, and you use it. little slice and then the bump thing. Yeah, because yeah. this guy, this guy can, I can use this to basically sand Black Warbler. Because uh, I set it to the right temperature where it just barely kind of like melts the surface a little bit. And then you can draw it along the black warbler and like work out um, like problems and bumps and darts mainly. So right. when you're covering something, you need to dart out a section because you need to like it needs to go over a round or it needs to get smaller in an area. You'll cut out a little triangle and when you join those two pieces together, or if you've been smoothing it to get bubbles out and now you've got extra on one side, you can cut out that area and use this to smooth down the two sides so it looks like there was no seam there. Right, okay. and you can even take like other, you can like cut out little strips of black warbler and use this Magic. to like weld it into 
to Black Warblow by just pushing along and pushing them together. Huh. Okay. Um, you, and you can do basically this is this is our finishing tool for thermoplastic, yeah. and it, it's been super super helpful. It does not work with pearly art. Right. It, it hated or pearly regular art. Or, or and, yeah, and regular Warbler, it just doesn't get. Regular Warbler doesn't have as much like centralized heat focus that Black Warbler can do. And it just, it yeah, works just, so much better with the right. Black Warbler. So this tool plus Black Basically, Warbler Basically, this magic. is the reason that we stopped using any Warbler other than Black Warbler. Yep. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, one thing found the tool. similar um, that I've used is actually a wood burning tool that has different kits. So it has different flat ones because I use one of them for 3D printed things because I weld those together, you know, put fill the gap, weld it in. And I've done some similar on um, like the multi piece cups on breastplates, for example, put a little warbler and then use the, the wood burning tool with this flat edge to fill that in. Yep. But I haven't used it for trying to like overall smooth, overall smoothing. I've gone through like wood glue hell and I don't like it anymore because like I the just, main reason I don't I like it either. It, is um, right here, it's starting to chip off. So yeah. you see the raw wood now. Yeah. I was gonna say, so not, it, one it, thing <laughs> that you guys convinced me to try is some flex bond. Yay! <laughs> no, I just remember like for the wood glue was like do, trying to figure out the mixtures when we're trying to do the smoothing for Ebon Blade and we'd like, the mixtures would kind of change for some reason. Yeah. For yeah, what? So some people suggest Oh yeah, wood glue, water it down like half half or something like that mm -hmm. to make it easier on your paintbrush to smooth it. Other people say do a mixture of wood glue mod podge, wood glue gesso, or like some three type thing where it's water gesso and wood glue. And it's yeah, I we don't a lot of we don't use things. any of that. We <laughs> tried we tried wood glue one time, hated it. Didn't ever use it again. And then we tried resin one time. Oh god, that was hated oh, god. It. absolute nightmare. We had to get like a hanging. We, we hook got the and... idea from somewhere. I don't remember where. And we tried it, and it was awful. Oh it shit! Was dumb. I don't even know why we tried. <laughs> We're like, why are we doing this? Is, but there's some spray people talk about using that is kind of like a spray-on resin. I think right. but I don't remember what it's called. Oh, is it called frog juice? Mm -mm, not that. Because that's frog juice is a sham, by the way. <laughs> Absolute sham. I, I believe I believe that it works in some places, but I think it's really, really temperamental with uh, temperature and humidity. Oh so yeah. It, like it works really well for some people because they're like they just hit it at the right time or like their climate is right. And it works not at all for others, just depending <laughs> on what your environment is. So if you're in Florida, you might be kind of SOL. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I think if you're anywhere but like I don't know, like sunny San Diego. <laughs> And it, it gets humid in really the out. I say, yeah, it does get humid there. Uh, say, compared to Texas, where we, we get not, like not as humid as Texas, but it's kind of humid in the 70s, is their normal thing. Yeah. And then if you were in like the valley area of California, it'd be pretty dry, desert like, easy hundreds so, during summer. Arizona. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Marching band was kind of painful in like the Southern California where I grew up. Oh, it was hot on an AstroTurf field. Yeah, so I mean, if you want to try frog juice, like go for it. Just be aware that like it might not work the first time you try. Don't just put it straight on until you're finished piece. Like do thing with uh, it or and, you okay. will not have a good time. This is my story of frog juice. So frog juice was great until it wasn't. Um, <laughs> so it goes on really nice and it's like, oh cool. This is a nice, you know, finisher. It's a good sealer, a good primer. It can finish off my paint and this was when I had made Sully from Final from uh, Fire Emblem, and okay. it's I painted it the first time, and I used like a regular you know Krylon satin finish, and it got a couple scuffs on it. So I was like, okay, well it's time to redo a bunch of the paint, and you know I can re clear coat it. So I was like, let's try frog juice. So I put frog juice on after I had done my fix ups, and wore it to another convention, and within so the problems that happened on the costume the first time was after wearing it a couple times Okay. Mm -hmm. on the con floor. And then the, the time I wore it with frog juice, I wasn't even from like the bed in the hotel to the hotel room door before I already had like missing paint on friction marks. Ooh. Frog juice does not protect your paint job. It will scuff off immediately. It will scuff off 
entirely like it went all the way down to the raw material it just took off all of my paint like, why does this product exist that's my question uh, for okay <laughs> it's, because it's i think main it, purpose it, yeah. was for um vinyl outdoor like those signs that are made up like the oh. for outdoor hanging and stuff like we're open and like liquidation sale and whatnot but that's what's sprayed onto it to make it weatherproof and someone found out that this could work on cosplay and yes it could work on pieces that don't have friction if it has any sort of friction it's just going to immediately just poof it, it sounds <laughs> like a, it's, a very it's a weatherproofing not a like friction proofing yeah i was gonna say it sounds like very specific use case kind of item yeah. to potentially use but still but for most of us that use case yeah. so just use off. just use like Krylon sat finish it's fine <laughs> it's fine use regular clear coating varnish um lacquer whatever just stay away from frog juice do yourself a favor <laughs> so and it's funny how it's we, also cheaper and, and funny how we talk about all this now because you know we're going to be talking right? about you know painting and sealing which i know janella <laughs> like painting is kind of your thing especially yeah um, i do i do the painting um because i don't really think in 3D the way that armor patterning like lends itself to. So most of my patterning for sewing is done with flat drafting. Um, I don't do a lot of draping. I try to avoid it when I can. <laughs> I just don't have the 3D brain like that for huh. some okay. time. So the the armor working is mainly Alan's thing because his brain can work in those three dimensional like geometric shapies. Um, so I wind up getting the painting, which is also something that I've just I found a knack for my whole life. So I've been around okay. painter my whole life. So it's kind of like, this is just something that I'm used to. And mm. I personally don't like sanding. So if I get to paint and finish, he has to sand and make. So. The, the final step that we do before paint. Um, sand and dry. Right, sand is and we dry. use, we like to use filler primer. <laughs> okay. And, because it's kind of like, it's your in-between step between your, your smoothing and your painting. Mm -hmm. um, cause you're priming for paint but you're also still like trying to fill in little inconsistencies and sand those down to get an even smoother finish okay as you can with your material then we use filler primer and then sand that and filler prime and sand and filler prime and sand until we're happy with it then we paint it so the filler primer that we're using is the automotive filler primer that's in rattle cans oh okay yep and so like what all will you use that on um Limited primarily much. Warbler, but we've used it on foam. We too. use it on everything, honestly. I am not a big fan of. Oh gosh, what is it called? Um, Plasti dip. There we go. I'm just not ah. a big Plasti dip because of the humidity, the humidity, like section that it only works in because we're not in that humidity section for very long. <laughs> so well, no, so it's usually, when we're not crafting something, is when it's prime Plasti dip time. But you don't have anything made, so. We wind up usually just um, like having to use something else, and we found out that filler primer works just as fine. So. Well, and I'm just gonna say, and, what, and, and Kristen, yeah, go figure out what the hell Burrito yeah, is doing. So and Burrito, Burrito probably no. needs like stream attention anyway. And actually, one thing <laughs> that just popped out of my head for Plasti Dip because isn't it like a a little thicker than like maybe what uh, filler primer would be anyway? So that's that yes. would be something to consider outside of the humidity and workability aspect so oh yeah right well the nice thing about plastic dip is that you end up with kind of a rubber finish mm -hmm. which yeah. means it's going to be more resistant to cracking and stuff like that because it's it's got a little bit of flexibility uh, can which can be really be... nice on certain areas of armor where like there is some like pulling and a little bit of movement um plastic dip can be really helpful there okay uh, just like we we prefer filler primer because we like to add that extra level of smoothing so we can Ooh. sand again after we after we prime. I say so. I'm kind of curious about the paint choices um, after like you put in the filler primer. Um, yes, like on here was acrylic and oil paints. Um, yeah. Um, so I pretty much I paint with everything, anything. Um, I paint with like the cheap little craft barrel and whatnot like that's like a craft smart and apple barrel and all of those um acrylic paints and i i like them there's a ton of different colors there's literally every color under the sun um and then for like more heavy duty paints i can go grab a couple brands i think 
you just scrubbed a can of filler primer. Yeah. So. so to answer your question, this we use the just standard Rust-Oleum two-in-one sandable filler primer. Um, it's like I think it's a little bit under ten bucks, and you can find it at Walmart. You can find it in like automotive okay. sections. Um, we usually just go to Walmart and just buy all of them. They usually have like four or so. <laughs> Uh, when yeah. we need to, when we need to refill, I was gonna say probably not a very well, common thing. Question to fill. about that. Yeah. Um, what about pieces that are gonna be under more stress and want to flex more? Do you still use filler primer, or that's where we were we were talking about things like uh, like plastic dip, or we might even consider just using a Mod Podge finisher yep. in that Mod situation. Mod Podge or Flex Bond. Or Flex Bond, yeah. Um, there are other options definitely for for those sort of situations. Flex bond I found is just really good for that kind of situation because it not only like layers upon itself, it is flexible in nature. So if it is in a spot like that, it's not going to want to crack. It's going to want to move with it. And the more layers you put on it, the stronger that seal is and the more smooth that seal is because it is self-leveling. So mm -hmm. what we found though is if you're if you if you use the filler primer on an area like that where you need the flexibility then don't just paint it with an acrylic. You can paint it with like um, a paint mixed with a Mod Podge maybe or something like that. If you put the layer on top of this as a flexible layer, usually that'll that'll also work. Because yeah, so. um, we've done your paint we've done this and then done like an acrylic mixed with Mod Podge as our actual paint layer on top of that in an area that was, you know, a little bit flexible, and that was gen that was that worked okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean it wasn't like yeah. you know, maximum durability, but it was was good enough. Okay. Um, and then I guess another option could be like the plaid FX stuff that they're making mm. for cosplay because that yep. they say that they are flexible paint. <laughs> I have that one too. It's on my shelf. We've only <laughs> recently gotten some of it, so we haven't used yeah. it much yet. But ah. it seems cool. We have a bunch of it because we we won one of their giveaways, so we have like a ton of this. Paint. I'm just in, like the big bottles and this is just one of the smaller bottles that i picked up out of curiosity but now we have a giant one of this so i've got to find stuff to use it on <laughs> but for one of those oh, that i really like this um so regular acrylics always good super cheap they they're water-based so you can use um like any sort of like krylon satin finish on top of them and it won't cause it to bubble or do anything weird um because if you mix oil paints with water sealants, it's the same thing. Oil and water, they're gonna try to separate. They yeah. won't like each other. Even if one is dry, it's still going to cause like deep down chemical reaction. Yeah. So just try to make sure that you're not doing this on your final piece right before you need to wear it kind of thing. <laughs> hey, Con Crunch, talking about you. <laughs> so if you can test, that'd be awesome. Um, but with uh, acrylic paints, I haven't had any problems with like Krylon satin finish or the other brand, I don't remember its name, Rustoleum. Rust yeah, Rustoleum. Um, but then the Plaid FX ones, they have crazy coverage. Um, you can paint like two layers of this, and it's already just like gold on top of like brown or black, and it is just already starting to be super gold. Wow. Be nice. It, you, it's a fast working paint though, so you've got to, you got to truck along. Once you start painting this, you got to move. Um, you can water it down. It can go through an airbrush. Um, I prefer to paint it on by hand so far. I haven't tried with the airbrush yet. I'm a little, a little If you it. do the airbrush, you need like flow improver yeah, and flow thinner improver and, and thinner. stuff like that. So okay. that's straight. So how is it with like brush marks? Because I know um, some paint on gold, they're really bad about showing every little stroke. Yeah, um, that's when watering this down helps that. Um, with the brush stroke, with brush strokes, um, if you want to just put it on straight, that way it um, it it does get streaky. Um, so I recommend watering it down, and then also like painting your layers if you can um, in one go instead of only painting a section and then another section because you're not going to be able to get the join of those two sections quite right with this. Even if you start trying to layer it, it'll still you know sneak its way through the layers, and you'll be able to see where one side stopped and the other one started. Um, I personally like it. it. You do need to work fast with it though. Um, it doesn't like to blend as much with other paints. So if you have this and you have another gold that you want to use, um, mixing them can be a little tricky sometimes. 
And then if you're painting on your piece and your original paint is wet and you're adding like a, a shadow on and it's you're trying to blend the shadow into the piece to just make like a really soft, sh like a soft shading rather than like a harsh shadowing that you would do after the paint is dry on the main piece, um, it doesn't tend to blend well. So that's one thing that I found out about this. It doesn't blend as nicely as like acrylics or um, this type of paint. So this is Grombacher's Academy paint. It comes in the metal tube. This is the chomper of a paint. Um, I like putting this through my airbrush, but boy howdy do I need a lot of wow. uh, thinner because it literally comes out as a paste. This is this is like high quality painter's paint. It, it's a paste. It's a little more expensive. It is a little more expensive, but man, it was such a pretty gold before we got this. So like, <laughs> this is my go-to gold. This is a secondary because it's the new kid it's on the super, block. This is the new kid on the block. Take this kid's lunch money. So like, watch out. Same. So basically, <laughs> you have the Yahoo versus Google of paint. Yeah, <laughs> maybe even like Google versus like when Firefox was cool. <laughs> <laughs> but then um, the other paint that I like to use is the Golden brand. You can find it at Blick stores. Um, this is their specific brand. You can also see that this paint is separating. So I need to mm -hmm. shoot really well because this is a high flow airbrush paint, but okay. I don't use it in my airbrush. I use this on just paintbrushes and I paint it on by hand. Um, it self levels a little bit, but you need to use a wide paintbrush. If you're doing a big space, use a wider paintbrush, get more paint on. The faster you can get the paint on and smooth out your brush strokes, the better you are. Um, but it is, rubbery when you paint it on. So if you paint it on by hand, you are putting on more paint than what your airbrush would be able to pump out in a layer. So it gets a rubberized texture, which create, which lets it almost be a barrier towards scratching and hmm. chipping. And it gives you that flex. And it gives you a really good flex. That's one of so, the things we've put over the filler primer yeah. and been able to like flex. Yep. This is what the Huntsman is primarily painted with, is okay. this because you did something that would be able to withstand a lot of wear and tear. And honestly, I haven't had to do much like large fixing on the Huntsman for how many pieces he is and how much like surface area of gray there is on him. So- And how much rubbing he does on himself. <laughs> There's so much rubbing, all of the pieces, so much friction. Um, but I really like it. I definitely recommend these types of paints um, because they're not only for airbrush. So if it says, you know, if it's the golden brand and it says high flow airbrush, you can paint it by hand. It just takes a little bit more know-how on how to handle a brush. So, yeah. so a brush through your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I know these are one of your favorite tools for <laughs> Yep, the, the shading gray is what the other tiny bottle I have is the shading gray. And that's that's my thumbprints all over. Um, I love <laughs> shading gray. That's my other golden bottle that I've got. It's a good one. Well, I was gonna say, and actually that kind of, um something that came to mind there was like your actual painting tools you know you mm -hmm. know mentioned airbrushing you know paint brushes and also just like yeah you're you're <laughs> that's a great use of the of a stax can by the way it's wow. filled with paint brushes <laughs> when also i saw that i was like that's genius <laughs> i was gonna say when i saw that i was like that's genius that is very yeah, my mom is a ceramic artist so ah. i learned a lot of things like that from her also, That's... I don't throw away like little metal cans like ever. I always wind up keeping them to put paint in as I've mixed paint. So I've got like Wait, so mixed metal paints tin that cookies, are sewing supplies, or paint supplies. <laughs> it's a grab bag. It's a grab bag. It depends on the year. <laughs> I, I swear I'm like the only one who actually likes those cookies. But anyway, um... like them when they're in there. Yeah, <laughs> but especially the ones with the sugar crystals. Those, those are the best. Um, so. One thing you, which was put in all caps, <laughs> and all cats apparently, um, was moisture. <laughs> you know. Yes. Um, oh yeah. I mean, here in and... Texas, it's kind of always iffy, and and I've known some just from doing art and stuff, but uh, cosplay so, can only. Can I jump in, real Co quick, for a, a paint to moisture kind of segue? <laughs> um, so I noticed on the list there was oil paints, and I didn't touch on those, but I oh. do like oil painting so okay. when when 
we do a prop and we want to antique it or add texture into like low layers say i burned scales and do like a sword for huntsman this is what i did and with his armor okay. too all of the different little scaling on the dragon hide was done with um actually that's a paint that i don't have up here <laughs> let me grab it <laughs> i say yeah i thought you grabbed an oil paint earlier and i apparently missed it so yeah the Not this exact paint but this brand um Oh no, not this brand. Oh, I lied. That's, <laughs> that's bad. Oh, so, um, this brand of paints is also found at Blick, um, but I think you might be able to get it at Michael's. It's the Jacquard Lumiere line. Okay. Oh, the Lumiere stuff. Slightly metallic and like shiny. I like this paint. Can, yep, this can go on anything. It's a fabric paint. Um, it's a regular paint. Um, it can go on literally anything. I love it. It's it's like you can put it on leather, you can put it on foam, you can put it on warbler, you can put it on fabric. Super. You can put it on clear vinyl. Probably. <laughs> yeah, that's what I did for my sister's Elsa is I painted clear vinyl and cut out a million little scales and put them onto a bodice. Oh gosh. But the color worked out so great and it was that brand because I got a blue and a silver and I kind of oh, yeah. mixed a few different shades for it and mm. oof, it's great. <laughs> Though yeah, I, I, I'm obsessed with this stuff. Um, so the Lumiere line is really great for um, like if you want like golds and silvers that have like a slight kind of, they, they do have like little glittery shine to them. So if you want everything to be slightly like glittery, metallic, go for this. It's super cool. Well, uh, so the way we did the Huntsman was I put down this paint and then I did a layer of Mod Podge um, as my feeler because Mod Podge is pretty universal in its way that it doesn't really react with acrylic paints and it won't react with oil paints. Oh, so okay. I, it's, a, it's a safe ground for anything that I'm sealing underneath it. So that way I don't have to worry about what I'm stacking on top of it versus what I have underneath it. So there's no chemical reactions. Um, so I put Lumiere paint, which is an acrylic, so it's water-based, and then Mod Podge on top of that. And then I let the Mod Podge dry, and then I just smeared a lot of oil paint on top of it and just took an old like chip brush, just an ugly brush, um, and used that to kind of push the oil paint into the crevices so that way it would stain down into mm. the craft in the scales. And then before that could dry, because oil paint takes a long time to dry, but it doesn't take, it, it takes seconds to stain. Yeah. So you want to wipe it off quickly. Um, and what's nice because you get a little more time because of that Mod Podge layer in between everything because it sealed it. So it's not going to ruin the paint color underneath and nor is it going to like seep into the foam that's under it or the warbler that's under it and try to stain that. So wiping off the oil paint, such as an old t-shirt or something. Don't use paper towels. Doesn't work. Um, you want cloth. So old towels, old shirts, <laughs> things like that, wipe it off um, and it will stay in the crevices and then just slap on another layer of Mod Podge. Boom, done, magic. That's how that, that's how you I- know, One thing I've actually done for shading, for when it's, I wanted it to have more of a grunge look like mm. Bowsette, cause you can't tell me that Bowsette would be, you know, clean armor. So I actually used um, just like a cheap matte craft paint Oh. Because you know, I wanted it to be grungy, not, you know, fine shading. And that's what mm -hmm. I did all of this in, is I just did a teeny tiny line and then took um, those stiff brushes. I don't know exactly what they are, but they're the really like, I stiff call them ones. chip brushes. Chip brushes are, right, we'll go with that. And <laughs> I just kind of like fling it up over the edge that I'm going yeah. to make like little, little, just little lines that right. go mm -hmm. up around. But most of it is in that crease. So on the scales, I put it here and then dragged it down and dragged it up. And yep. same thing with all these, drag down, drag up with the most of it in that crease. Yeah. Let's just say, and Tao is just like. Cuddly. Purring. All the um, baby. So, so actually so, real quick. Um, bef well, no, before we go into that, um, cause something just also popped in my head. Was the type of paint versus whatever detail you're attempting to achieve with with said paint especially for system material because you know the viscosity of your paint and how it might work with the technique i'm kind of curious you know do you have any thoughts of like 
hey, pain choice if I know I want to do this very specific thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it will come into more of like, what kind of a character are you doing? Are you doing someone that's going to have more of a clean finished look? If so, you probably want to do like the nicer oil paint shadowing. If it's total grunge look, then doing like the craft paint like I did for Bowsette, that works. It, okay. You're going to need to think what suits that character, kind of like with fabric. Okay, I'm making a princess is a cotton fabric going to fit her nice formal dress no it's not because she's a princess it needs to be something a bit fancier so and to then it all for me it's how much i need to cover and like how many layers i can safely put on there because the more layers you put on it the more chances you're giving yourself for possible layer failure whereas like something beneath it didn't dry quite completely or something cracks as you put more layers onto something, you can it can inevitably crack, and then that causes all sorts of issues. So um, I just go, usually I paint a lot of metallics, so for my golds, I need them to have good coverage. And so I go for the more opaque paints okay. and, that have more pigment to them. So that way I know that I'm getting more bangs my back. Do a base coat that is like say you're doing gold do you do a brown and then the gold or do you just dive in straight to gold if your paint is a thick enough one to work doing that it depends um so sometimes i want the gray color of the filler primer underneath um because the color of the gold i it doesn't matter um it just needs to be gold but if i want like an antiqued gold or like kind of a almost like a brassy gold i'll put brown or red underneath it depending on how warm i want it to be Okay. If I want really shiny gold, I'll put black underneath it or white. Okay. Um, white is actually harder to cover, which is yeah. kind of weird. Mm -hmm. It will always look like it's taking away the shine of the gold. So if I want shine, if I want gold but without shine, I'll put white behind it because the white, even though it's underneath these layers of gold, still kind of absorbs the light for some really weird reason. Yeah, it does. It does. Black will kind of make it bounce more and it causes the gold which is brighter on top of it to really reflect the light and that's why if i want something like super shiny i put a black underneath it well, i think it's a study of contrast is, yeah. is the reason there because like if it's all got a white back when the paint or when the light is making it to your under layer and hitting white it's bouncing everything back and making less contrast between your underlayer and your sparkliness of your so account. so funny. I was about to mention something similar, especially from a photography aspect, because um, there's what's called V flats, and yes. typically they're yep. gator board. They're like they're made out of gator board, where one side is black and one side is white. So no, you you are very spot on about the, the <laughs> white versus black, uh, especially for something like gold. No, you're very spot on. Um, I find that fascinating because it's like painting on a costume is relevant <laughs> to still terms of color and photography which is relevant to terms of color and actual artistry and it's just like we're all and physics and physics yes physics <laughs> you can roll that into like the reflectivity of something right. and there's yeah. various ways to talk about reflectivity but we won't go into that right <laughs> yeah they're they're this rabbit well if you thought the cosplay rabbit hole was deep as it was there, there's an underground city now at this point so um, mole people there's just mold everywhere. So, uh, and yeah, I mentioned this earlier, but we were talking about moisture, you know, Damn. Texas. So, so the the, the first it. place where you need to think about moisture is anytime you're using a rattle can of anything. Yeah. Uh, oh, you bring yeah. Something oh, onto God. something, you have to worry about moisture. I don't care what it is. <laughs> um, and the, the rule of thumb is just to watch your weather. Mm-hmm. Try to try to use rattle cans only if it's fifty percent or below. That's sort of like your yeah. generally is okay for most sprays. Yeah. But they all have different like like if you read the back, they'll all tell you what they want to be. But this one here says temperature needs to be between fifty to ninety degrees Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. ten to thirty Celsius, and the humidity needs to be below sixty five percent. But you're, yeah, so the, they all have their own instructions. Read those, use them if you can. Uh, but the rule of thumb is if you're 50% or below, you should be okay. And uh, temperature wise, actually, I find that the temperature is not so much air temperature that's required, it's the temperature of the can. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. The can 
put a can in like a, a we have a small bucket because it's cold here for half the year right like we wouldn't be able to use this in half the year because it's definitely not going to be 60 degrees until march at least yeah uh, so what we do is we just have a bucket of of hot water that we just fill up in the sink and then we just stick this in there for oh. like 15 and then this will the the temperature of the can will get high enough that we can uh we just take it out of the bucket go and spray and then bring our stuff inside um, that too the item that's being sprayed was also stored inside so right. it is of room temperature so the item so. and the can are warm yeah. and then i go outside where it's cold spray it really quickly um and then bring the stuff back inside that's usually my strategy for when it's cold out because you can kind of get around it as long as you're quick and everything's warm before okay that. i was gonna say i never yeah, yeah i would have to try and get it to go on smooth and not globby. Yep. Well, I was gonna say, and actually, well, let's talk about the reverse because you know we're in Texas. You know, summer is a poison status here. <laughs> um, I don't. I'd have to wonder how much, how well that would work in the reverse. Like, if you would put paint in cold water. I don't know. Yeah. Um, um, it's not. It's not a problem that we have to deal with up here. <laughs> you don't really need to worry about putting it in cold because if you put it in cold, that's when it's going to glob together yeah. when you're trying to spray it. So you just wouldn't want to do that. The big thing is going to be the humidity and how it dries in summer in Texas. I think, if you <laughs> well, can, I think if you can have it in room temperature and then take it outside where it's hot and spray it right away, I think you'd have a similar... Mm -hmm. okay. A similar outcome there. As long as your stuff is your your this and your what you're spraying is the right temperature, I think you'd be okay. Yeah. Uh, you definitely have to worry about humidity because humidity will get you. You you can't escape it. Humidity. No. Yeah. Gets into your. One thing you want to think about because the temperature of the what's in the can is important is how long are you spraying? Maybe instead of doing the entire thing in one go, you want to do it in two. That way you can put it back in the warm water. Because physics, as you spray it, it's going to get colder. Right. You know, when you spray a can, it's get colder and colder and colder, and then you're more likely to get those globs coming out and landing on whatever you're painting. Yeah. So put it back in the warm water for like five minutes, then do more spraying. And then too, I mean, if the air is like literal soup, you probably don't want to be spraying in it or chancing yeah, it you, because yeah. you just there's just so point. much moisture. There's no... Sorry. There's just so much moisture in the air that when you're spraying the spray can, those particles are going to be grabbing moisture and taking it down with it because they're going to sink with that. So then you automatically have moisture in your primer and that is, that's a death sentence. So you, you don't want that at all. Um, it'll cause, it'll look fine and then it'll start to dry and it'll get these weird spider web cracks, kind of like broken glass it has these like kind of telltale crack marks you'll get that in your primer layer. And no matter how many layers of primer you stack on top of that, they are hard to get out. Um, hey, Kirsten, aren't you glad that we're Austin cosplayers and not like Galveston cosplayers by that regard? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad not to live down there in general. <laughs> You're not wrong there. So no. let's actually also talk ceiling, um, you know, especially because, you know, with a place like Texas, we have to worry about weather and how that affects cosplay. So one, it's like, say you want to do a water photo shoot. You want, if you're going to put your armor in water, you need to consider <laughs> the ceiling even more to make it withstand whatever you're going to do to it. Because it might not just be the friction of a convention for you bumping into things. Yeah. So, and actually, this is because um, you mentioned a uh, spray and paint on sealer, and I'm kind. Like spray sealer, I'm kind of familiar with, but I was what wasn't full full familiar with paint on. So I'm kind of curious about the differences between the two and how you apply what to when. I guess for me, it's just kind of whichever one I feel like doing. Um, if we're if we can spray, we'll spray it. Um, it's spraying is easier because it's like airbrushing. You're not going to get you know, paintbrush marks. Whereas mm -hmm. with paint, there's always the likelihood that you might get brush strokes with it. So if I'm using flex bond, I'm going to water it down, but if it pools in an area, it's going to show that, you know, there was flex bond there or something was painted there. Whereas if I use a clear, like a clear sealant or like a lacquer, 
it's not going to have that. I might get Telltale, this was a rattle can where it kind of gets like grainy, but yeah. if you heat your can and it comes out smooth, you usually don't have that problem. Or, you know, if you spray in an area that doesn't have a lot of dust. So like, you know, if you have a garage, make sure you can cover the piece when you're done spraying it so it doesn't get dust particles that are just mm -hmm. in the air or like an unfinished basement. They're just kind of floating around. So you want to cover your piece. So put it in a box that has a lid or something or um, your makeshift box has a makeshift lid. <laughs> so I guess for me, it's just kind of, if it's a small piece that's like really fiddly, I can just kind of have it on my workbench and I can paint it by hand. Um, then I'll do on primer or paint on sealer mm -hmm. but it's a big thing i will try to go for the rattle can well i was gonna say and actually to that point because uh i was also curious about types of sealer you tend to work with um in their applications as well because you mentioned lacquer so i'm kind of curious along those lines what you would suggest to people to use and you know once again when in that regard uh for me, I just, for the clear sealants, I just, I really like the rattle can clear sealants. Those just seem to be kind of the overall, like, this is a good umbrella to live in. This uh -huh. one is fine. It works on pretty much everything. Um, then for smaller things, I try to use flex bond or things that need to be, things that are, like, really three-dimensional or have, like, a lot of sides, whereas, like, the rattle can might, you might not be able to, like, run around the entire thing or get, like, a really smooth finish on it. Right. So I'll do those ones by hand. Um or if it's really small, just do it by hand because why, you know, why waste the time getting the rattle can ready and like having to flip it or something like that when I can like paint it and then paint on the sealant and then hang it up so it dries. Um, lacquer and things like that and uh, wood varnish, I use on like resin gems specifically and okay. that all apply by hand. Um, I won't use a rattle can on those ones. So I'll get like the, the wood varnish that's in a, in a can that you have to like use the um, screwdriver. screwdriver to open and things like that. So that'll use like an old rag and I'll wipe that onto the gems to give them a real luster. But I, yeah, I don't usually use that on props or in armor or anything like that. So. Okay. So how do you decide if you're going to go for a glossy or a matte? That's for a your I think. <laughs> um, I think a lot of that is just the costume. Is it, you know, is it a dark fantasy game where I don't want to be glossy? Is it like, you know, just what is it usually mm -hmm. like, is it, should it be glossy? Should it be matte? Mm -hmm. you know, like what? And you can do two different types too. Like if you, if you're doing a sword and you want the hilt to not be super duper shiny and silly looking, but you want that sword to be like, I'm going to cast the rays of the sun and blind you. Right. Use <laughs> use glossy on that and then like tape off and like plastic bag your hilt and then reverse you know tape off and plastic bag your your sword blade and then spray matte on or even a satin finish on the hilt because don't be afraid of satin finishes i find them actually the most beautiful because they're not Satin's almost cartoony shiny and yeah. they're not matte it's that so nice middle like ground it's that nice right. middle it's ground. A great i think i think a lot of times we end up using satin yeah I mean, in certain situations, like if you're doing like Game of Thrones, you want matte. Yeah. If you're doing like Witcher. Dragon Quest, you want glossy. Yeah. You know, like because you're <laughs> you're going like full cartoon. For a lot of cosplay, like in the middle ground, you probably want satin. Yeah, like Zelda and things like that. You mm -hmm. could do satin finish because it has realistic elements to it, unless you're going like super like cartoony. Twilight Princess or you're doing, you're Twilight doing the old Princess. 3DO games. You can even do games. a satin on Twilight Princess one too. Honestly. You're doing the it's 3DO like, Zelda Twilight. games and you go cartoony. So, <laughs> Yes, I dated myself there. I don't care. So, uh, so I think the finish is more about the costume itself than the piece. Okay. So <clears throat> I was going to say I'm going so once again moisture was in caps for sealing. <laughs> <laughs> though, though, is there differences to maybe consider versus maybe paint in that regard, or are they actually pretty similar? It's pretty similar, I would pretty say. Similar. Yeah, I and mean, I just I paint whenever, but I don't spray paint whenever. So right, right. same same with sealing. Like the the spraying, you have to be really careful with moisture. The paint on ones are pretty okay. Paint on ones are okay unless you're using an airbrush. Then you do have to be right. cautious of how how much moisture is in the air because it can affect the as the paint is coming out of the airbrush, 
and it's hitting your item. It's picking up particles as it goes. I mean, if I'm a if I'm a Texan sitting in like eighty percent, I'm probably not going to even do a paint on sealer because you need a sealer to completely dry. <laughs> yeah, here it's generally not an issue for us, I guess. Probably not. Well, I was going to say up here in Austin, it's not always bad. I mean, you know, if you're in Galveston or Corpus or whatever, you probably would be SOL, but. So um, I, I have two questions I'm going to ask. This is a two-part question for, well, all three of you. So one, what's a material you want to tackle for armor making? And Kirsten, you go first on this one. So this is slightly going to like a different type of armor making, but one thing I really want to try to do is 3D design armor. I just don't have like a 3D form to design on yet. Because, I don't know, it seems really cool. I've seen people design crazy armor pieces, like, uh, there's someone who did this, but 3D modeling, so their skull had crazy amounts of detail on it. Yeah, was it, it might have been Haku props? It was one of the people involved with the initial Ebon Blade group. Oh, it's cool. whoever did um, the Lich King, that person. He did a lot of 3D designing for a lot of others. But that kind of tackles more 3D printing and how to handle that kind of armor. <laughs> um, but in normal armor, um, I'm trying to think, because like I've done different types of phone. I've done Warbluff. I haven't done Sintra. I don't know if I would, but it's really like... It's very special yeah. case material, because really it only fragile. has it only has the one bend, because it's PVC. Mm -hmm. And you have to be very yeah, so finding a scenario where I'd want that instead of war blood that can right. you know do whatever the heck any direction I want it to do. Yeah, there are and certain things. The only things we really use it for is for like if you if we need just a bracer that's one bend and we want it to be really smooth because it's much easier to smooth a Sintra piece than a warble piece. It's a lot less work. If it's something where it's really it's literally just one bend, one curve, we'll often use Sintra for that just because it's less work. Yeah, in like the high, like ease area where there's no friction or anything touching because the it, Sintra, it, can, yeah. it can just snap right. or it it's can not durable. get dented. So, yeah, definitely not durable. But it's very but... smooth, so it's it does. There's not a lot of extra work we have to do for it. So, uh, wait, wait, what's a material you want to tackle at some point for our armor build? I mean... <laughs> We've kind of found the sweet spot with Black War Plus. <laughs> it's hard to, like, think of using I'm, I'm anything trying to, I'm else. I'm trying to think of things that I haven't, like, messed with. Um, I would maybe consider trying to use metal someday. Oh, fancy. But that probably wouldn't be for cosplay, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> That's just, like, more of a, a fun thing I could try to do. Just to do it. it into 3D printing, so yeah, we might would, be throwing some questions well. your way, Kirsten, because we... <laughs> Well, and actually, that, that was going to lead to my next bit, was like, a technique. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, and, you know, 3D printing especially was kind of how recent it is, you know, especially with availability to cosplayers, because, yeah. let's face it, cosplay is kind of expensive, and cos cosplayers don't always make the most money. <laughs> um, so to now kind of have that availability... Yeah. For that, I mean, you know, for technique, is that maybe like is three D printing maybe the way you would go and maybe try to go explore and see where it adds to your work? I mean, we'll probably try it. <clears throat> we we try almost anything. I mean, that's yeah. that's why this question was kind of difficult for me because I was trying to think of materials that I haven't tried. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was it was Fiber hard. Glass because it's dangerous. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. We tried resin. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, like if, I we we really try to like mess with everything that's out there that people mm -hmm. use just to just to see if we like it, um, and just to play with it. You know, yeah. some of the some of the hobby is just playing with stuff. Well, I was gonna say uh, actually what popped into my head because I do know some people have done this through uh, actually through Ghostbusters groups and um, GI Joe group uh, that I'm friends with was like vacuum forming for yeah. like yeah. doing yeah. props. Yes. So. Uh, yeah, a lot of 501st members use vacuum forming. So oh, yeah. we, mm -hmm. we've had that walk into a few judging rooms before where someone's vacuum formed something. And I think it's the neatest thing, but then it's also you need a vacuum form table in order to do that. Yeah, They're very specific items. So right. if yeah. you need it for one time costume use, 
it's obviously not going to be very cost effective for you to build one or to buy, or to even buy one. So that's another thing I would consider. Maybe maybe someday I'll build a vacuum farming table. No. <laughs> <laughs> First. Well, yeah, I mean, it's low on my priority <laughs> list, but that are like, I don't know, maybe like a laptop size because it doesn't take too much to do that. But if you need a large one, it's a pain. But even just um, making the right kind of blanks for vacuum forming, like if you 3D print it, you have to use insanely high infill so that it won't collapse on itself. Yeah. So that's yeah. one of the drawbacks to vacuum forming is just the blank you're using to form on. Yeah. Yeah. So, Kirsten, what's a technique you want to tackle at some point for armor making? Mm, that's a good question. So, eventually, I'm probably going to do some things with acrylic because eventually I'll get around to those crazy mercy wings, and, you know, I want those blades to be, like, oh, you know, yeah. nice and clear. And, yeah, so that's one thing I'm going to eventually get to. It keeps getting dogged down on the list, but it's there. <laughs> it only keeps getting uh, dumped down on the list because you keep adding costumes to the list. I, mean, come on. Yeah. Anyway, I can't help things are pretty. Anyway, go ahead. Continue. <laughs> um, so actually there's something, well, two things I realized I forgot to mention when we were talking about these in sections. So if you guys know you're going to try to put electronics or something in something, how do you make up for that in your patterning process? Yeah, that's, or is there that's a good one. Consider that's a good one. I know that you have a lot more experience with that. We don't usually put a lot of light things. We haven't so. done it much yet. We have a couple plans um, yeah. and ideas and stuff. And really, it, what it boils down to is just making space within the armor mm -hmm. that's not where you go, that the <laughs> electronics go. Um, I mean, that's the key in the in the patterning phase, you right? You can't just, go. Right, yeah. You, you, you just have to make space for it, and you just have to plan ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't um, sure what fun you guys have had with lighting, because, like, the I've done the shoulder pieces for Ebon Blade all have lights, and then the Frostmourne I made, that has an LED strip in it, but I didn't wire it myself, so it has a big old chonky battery thing, so the hilt on that sword is gigantic <laughs> to fit that, so it slides right. in. Um, but like what I did for these, even though this is going to change as of right now, it's just like a little, um, like fairy light battery pack yeah. that makes this light up Ooh. and all of the LEDs are up under the dragon skull. Yeah. And then, um, because I'm going to swap to an Arduino, I actually made a hole in this nice. <laughs> so that I could have electronics here and then the wiring go up into, so changing batteries is really easy. Right. And then... Yeah, if you're working with LEDs, usability is for sure a big concern. Mm -hmm. So like, well, this say, battery is the most important to thing. Mm -hmm. So for this one, the plan is to put like felt or something on here, just to kind of cover it over mm -hmm. and give it, you know, so I don't have light leaking. But then the battery pack is either going to slide up in here or here. Right. So and same thing with the Arduino, maybe, or it's going to have like a pouch under the cape. I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> Well, but it has say, two shoulders and like that one that's one so it's all in it well i was so gonna say that's, that's actually one good thing you know with the advances in tech is you know the miniaturization and the ever lowering of power needs for this tech mm -hmm. we could do some really cool right. stuff you know and you know do stuff that like, like we hadn't thought about before this one it's all just empty on the inside and again i'm probably gonna put felt to prevent leaking like from here because i want it to come out the mouth but not all of it and then in here i sandwiched it between some of the led foam and then glued craft foam on top because my clear warbla and black warbla test didn't go well it's particularly <laughs> the clear that didn't go well um but yeah, it's just a lot of, I don't know how well you can see the holes in there, because these blades, I did those separate, and then slid them into the dragon skull. Oh, okay. So you can kind of see where the wires come out. So that's one thing I've realized is, you know, you don't necessarily want to hide all of the wiring, because what if something does come undone? Because, like, I actually mm -hmm. had to tear open one of those blades to re-solder something, because it got bumped when I when it was all sealed, so... As he's, I've ribbon holding it so it's drying, but I peeled this open so I could fix it, glued it back down, and then I'm gonna craft foam in to fill that, and maybe I'll turn 
into some partial battle damage. I don't know. <laughs> it would make sense because this is the edge blade, and there's actually a gouge right there, and here's another one. Which also, that reminds me, how do you guys try to plan your battle damage so it makes sense? <laughs> yeah. Instead of, oh, this is an accident, it's battle damage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that works sometimes, but not all the time. Um, <laughs> I guess it's, it is the character in yeah. an armor that would have battle damage on it, so like... You know, a lot of Fire Emblem characters have really pretty pristine armor, but what they do is fight, but they have pretty pristine armor. Right. So are you going for an actual, like, grunge, like, literal, like, low fantasy-esque field <laughs> Fire Emblem character, or are you going by the design? Because I think... You can't usually... half it. Right. You have to either go one way or the other. And then that has to reflect, too, in, like, the sewn items and the weapon and mm -hmm. possibly your makeup. Like, it's got to hit all the elements so it can't just be oh well the armor I goofed up on a little bit so it's battle damage but like they're wearing a pretty pristine white loincloth it's perfect you know like mm -hmm. this tabard has no damage on it you know it's like and for some reason well, that's what the shoulder piece actually what popped into my head since you said that was like Nintendo being so clean about like a lot of their yeah. <laughs> character mm -hmm. designs and how there's also room to play with doing stuff like battle damage so right i think usually from our perspective we usually only include the battle damage if it's there on the model yeah um mm -hmm. but i mean if you're thinking about battle damage like janella said just make sure you carry it through the costume instead yeah. of just being out of place like here's a battle damage and here's, here's a battle, battle damage, damage and it's you know, very you, you have to like make the whole costume look like it's been through ha something. Having the cohesion in the look. Yeah, yes. that's the big yeah. thing. One thing I do, um, because, so, you can't really see it well, but, so there's a slice here, slice on these, slice there, which actually yeah. has the heat to do. I use my, um, one of the wood burning tips. I wasn't just gonna put one here, because what's the odds that it's just gonna hit the jaw and none of the teeth? Mm -hmm. Or I did one here, and uh, one of the teeth have a little nick in it, or here, and it goes across. So yeah. here wouldn't make sense. If it's going to hit here, it will hit here. Yeah. So I try to think of it as like, okay, what kind of thing would do this? And does this damage reflect it? So I think this one also has, yeah. So this one has a slice that goes from the upper plate to the lower plate. Because I was like, well, if it hit there, it would hit both. It wouldn't yeah. just hit one. And so I try to think of it that way. And, um, when I was holding this, I thought of a second thing. This was not the second thing I initially thought of, but um, one thing I used my wood burning tool was to texture the horns. Yeah, I remember seeing There's that. There's a whole bunch of little yeah. lines on there. It took forever, um, but that's another way you can use heat tools to add more to it. Mm -hmm. So it's just adding, especially if it's something like horns or bone. You know, real animals. There's going to be a variation in that. For these, I kind of went line crazy because I felt it suited it. <laughs> So, you know, just gonna run with it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I did on the Huntsman Teeth as well. They've got all their little lines and stuff in them too. Which then the oil paint sinks really nicely into. So. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, and, and I was gonna say that actually popped uh, popped into my head another idea for another video panel. Oh God. Like I said, the co uh, cosplay rabbit hole is deep. It's actually like design cohesion awesome. for cosplay. Oh yeah. Yeah, that would definitely be a thing. So, uh... uh well, oh. The original second thing that is very <laughs> important, which is the main reason why Ebon Blade was delayed. Testing your strapping and attachments, and why it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, um, something like any of these shoulder pieces, even though they're a foam core with some warbla, they are heavy. I can't just attach it to a strap. Like uh, the Bowsette one, the shoulder for this is all foam. So it stays up just with, you know, one Velcro strip and it's good. However, that shoulder, I have the straps for the top. There's a cross strap in the front that's in the design. Um, so I'm going to have buckles along like the strap and then extra Velcro. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's something I want to be able to move my arm or lean over and not have that fly off. And I'm probably might have something on the arm too, possibly because it's very large. Um, so how do you guys? <laughs> it, it's a bit old I mean, look at it. 
it's it's, it's, it's big. Huge. And then like alleys before all the LED stuff was in there, I, I <laughs> it's a hat. <laughs> It's I don't big. remember this DLC this in Among has, Us. <laughs> and it's going to have two more at the sides to make sure that it stays in place and she can move right. and whatnot. Yeah. And this won't budge. So it doesn't it's suddenly wind up on her back. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's why she's going to have like cross straps in the front and probably in the back too to help distribute weight and make it more comfortable. Yeah. So um, what things do you guys consider when you're doing your different strapping and especially for things like huntsmen that are meant to be more movable right so well, um should be movable. <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple like touchstone points on your body that can really help stuff stay in place re in relation to you and not get in your way right here yeah the big ones are the top of the shoulder yep. and the waist um, so if you can, if, and those are also weight varying points for for people as well. Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna be carrying something around a lot for a long period of time, the best place to carry it is on the waist, and the second best is on the shoulders. Yeah, ideally um, not as great. No, so. I mean it, by second best I mean it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's better. Yeah, it's better than holding it with Good, your arms out. You know, like it's. <laughs> Uh, you, mean you don't love arm circles and want to do this with your arm. Right, yeah, exactly. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so the Huntsman's really funny because Alan actually has a belt that on his pants, like underneath everything, with a pair of suspenders, like leather suspenders, that then pieces attach onto at the top of his shoulders. So his arm pieces are all like up there with attachments to the shoulders, and it also helps keep the waist things up because now they're divided between staying on the shoulders and being cinched around the waist so there's a lot of weight on the huntsman around his waist so we were like well if he walks around or does this crazy dancing once or twice you know this is going to slide down over time so we have him attach onto the underbelt and then the suspenders too and everything so. pretty much everything on that costume comes back to touch on to my undershirt because i've got that yeah. long sleeved undershirt mm -hmm. with like a owl um, like a, a, a um, tight cowl. So mm -hmm. on that shirt, we have metal like D rings mm -hmm. in various places. Oh, we have stuff strapped into those those D rings on my shirt, uh, my undershirt there. That, yeah, so that like helps all the belts. stuff to keep in or it helps yeah. keep things in place. Like the the elbow pieces circling all the way back to the beginning. Um, those weird band rings are there's a D ring on his shirt that a leather belt then slips through and buckles how it's supposed to, and it keeps that piece oh. up. So, and then the piece kind of around it also help that keep that piece in place because the Huntsman is just so much. Like, so much. There's just piece, 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 piece. Yeah. Everything just kind of fits in its area and its area alone. <laughs> so we so really try to entrust our, our stuff staying in place to like metal rivets and straps if possible um or lots of velcro okay velcro. lots of velcro <laughs> i know ebon blade is a mixture of buckles and d-rings which haven't been put on yet they need to so like the knee piece um because you mentioned d-rings and i was like oh yeah that's what's gonna go here so there's a buckle that's gonna attach this to the pants i wear with it right above the knee Yep. And then um, these are probably going to have a belt with like D-rings and other things to help because, again, this is the the top piece that's supposed to kind of go with this, but yep. I'd like yeah. to walk. So walking right. is good. <laughs> it needs to be able to easily bend with my knee. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then this guy, even though one strap is missing, it just has a little, you know, goes across. Yep. Right. And yeah. Yay, craft clips are great. Now, are you comfortable? <laughs> she, so comfortable. I, I think she just like wants me to pet her, but she doesn't like to sit. So, uh, <laughs> what? That's like what Burrito will do. She'd rather pace around the table and get pets instead of be held and get pets. Yeah. Sometimes. So, yeah. Well, Tao, I'm going to have to move you again. Sorry. <laughs> it's that straight-legged cat. <laughs> so, you know, the, 
that's why I want to have this conversation um, regarding armor making because that, you know Kirsten and I have talked quite a bit, but there's so much to I it. I rant to him a lot. <laughs> yeah, like, this isn't doing what I wanted to do. Creative problem solving needs to happen. <laughs> Yeah, very. So, you know, Alan and Jella, thanks so much for joining us and having this conversation. And, you know, I know you've done this at cons, but, w uh, you know, that's why I said, you know, when we were talking, you know, let if we have rabbit holes we want to go visit, let's go visit them. Because <laughs> we like knowledge sharing. That's a great thing right. for us. So, um, actually, are you two going to be doing any cosplay streams again? Because I know you have your Twitch channel. Um, I would yeah, share your social will. medias, yeah. but the bot uh -huh. isn't going. So tomorrow, um, we are actually doing a, I guess tomorrow and then Sunday, the 20th, um, we're doing a panel for an online convention called Lala Con. Um, yeah, I saw that. About masquerades and co cosplay competitions. So we have someone from beginner, intermediate, and master, and then we also have an international person jumping in. So we've got the whole gambit, which is really nice to have kind of everyone at different levels speaking about their experiences and also just kind of knowledge sharing there. Yeah, really I saw like uh, actually uh, uh, Levi Cosplay, who was in the chat, they're actually going to be part of it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. L will be joining, so that will be that will be really fun. So yeah, I'll have to make sure to join that one. Time, so we've, we're kind of on the same brain. <laughs> Okay, I'll have to make sure to join that one. Um, so outside of that, because uh, I know, like I said, you have your own Twitch channel and you've been kind of doing a little bit. So I kind of, you know, what do you, what's in the works there for you? Uh, I think for us, it's more of a, more of like a, a hobby thing. Like we'll be like, hey, we're working on something that we could show people. So mm -hmm. let's hop on the the Twitch stream. We're not we're not really looking at like regular stream nights and stuff. We'll mostly be posting to our Instagram when we decide that. Okay. We Something that would be good for for streaming, and we're just gonna use it as kind of a um, a social tool while we're yeah. while we're crafting. Just kind of hang out and yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. We're not looking to grow yeah. a business or anything. We just want to <laughs> share some knowledge and hang out with people. Yeah, I totally. Pay attention to their story because they always post there when they think they're going to go live. Yeah, and eventually <laughs> when I get my setup a little more organized, we talked about doing some group repeat chill cry yeah. projects. Yeah, that'd be so fun. I mean, why not be like, oh, I'm doing this for the millionth time together, <laughs> right? It's even better when you're doing it together. <laughs> it, it it's all the shared pain. Yes, that's what it is. You know, distribute it, make it a little bit more even. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we'll go ahead and end it here. Uh, I actually have an outro video for once. Um, oh hey. So, for those. Um, in the chat uh we actually are taking donations and i'll actually explain it in the outro video uh later we'll actually have this video up on youtube and i'll make sure there's good timestamps because info knowledge <laughs> or info sharing <laughs> info sharing is great so so let's fire it off hey folks we hope you enjoyed our discussion about armor making with wigwood cosplay if you want to check them out on social media, make sure to check out all the links available in the descriptions below. Also, shout out to all of those who've donated to our live stream. We're trying to use the donations to get gear so we can actually do more detailed crafting streams and show you all the work that's being done behind the scenes. So if you want to donate, we will give you shout outs at the end of our videos for the next 30 days. You know, thanks for watching today, but most importantly, get dumb ideas, make them awesome. We'll see you next time.